Well, we recommence Romans, as you can see, for 2017. And tonight, as we've read, we're going to consider chapter 8. But given that we're recommencing, it's opportune that we just take a short recap, and I mean a short recap because we've eaten up a fair bit of my hour already, just over what we have looked at in the last seven chapters, which is the, the formulation of the Apostle's argument as he explains to the ecclesias of the city of Rome just how man might be saved. That is to say, in simple terms, how a righteous God could take an unrighteous man, ascribe righteousness to him without compromising God's own righteousness. That's the method of, of salvation that God will institute with man. And it's not as simple as just putting it all down on one page, as you can appreciate. But cast your mind back to the ecclesia that we met some well, 12 months ago when we first began this series. A very cosmopolitan ecclesia in Rome comprised of Jews and of Gentiles who were diametrically opposed on just how salvation could be wrought and who might be entitled to it. So the Jew thought, of course, that being a literal descendant of Abraham made him something special, more special than other men, and that the keeping of the law of Moses was essential for salvation. Well, the Gentile, on the other hand, could see straight through that, knew immediately that the law of Moses wasn't essential to be kept to be saved, but that because the Jews had so hopelessly failed to learn even the basic instructions of the law, he thought that God had cast off the Jews. And to make matters worse in the, in the ecclesias, neither of those two groups had any difficulty telling the other group how they felt. And that's how things are as you begin Romans. Well, what does the argument look like? The first major section is verses 16 and 17 of chapter 1. We've got an introduction, we've got a conclusion, but verse 16 of chapter 1 is the first section. And it's only a couple of verses, but it's a section because it's a definition. Man's got a problem. The problem is sin. Sin estranges man from God and then kills him. To solve that, God would enter into the arena of human affairs and demonstrate his character in his son. If man could identify with that son by his character in his life, then God could forgive him and save him. In Romans 1 verses 16 and 17, that is called the gospel of God. That's the good news of God. That would be the method by which God could save man from sin and therefore from death. Well, the balance of chapter 1 through to the end of chapter 3 is the next section, man's failure to obtain righteousness. And when I say man, I mean all of mankind, both Jew and Gentile. This is the, if you like, the, the graphic depiction of man's need for salvation. On the one hand, the Gentile world had buried itself so deeply in sin that they'd reduced themselves to animals, as you read in Romans chapter 1. On the other hand, the Jewish world had so completely decorated itself in self-righteousness that they were no longer recognisable as the children of Abraham. What that meant was that all mankind together, Jew and Gentile together, stood condemned before God. The last portion of chapter 3 through to the end of chapter 5, the righteousness of God was revealed. That is to say, it was revealed in the Son. Here's the entrance of Jesus Christ into the argument the Apostle makes. Paul now gets specific about how the righteousness of God actually was revealed. And as I say, it was revealed in the Son. And even though man could not come close to living or copying the example of the Lord Jesus Christ, if he would try, if he would make an earnest and conscientious attempt to do so, then God could forgive man by ascribing Christ's righteousness to him. So be clear, our good deeds, such as they are, if they're even all that good, our good deeds are not what gets us into the kingdom of God. They are what identify us with Jesus Christ. It's Christ's righteousness that gets us in the kingdom of God. That's the method, you see, by which, as I said before, a righteous God could take an unrighteous man, ascribe righteousness to him 
without compromising God's own righteousness. Well, that then brought us to the next section, chapters 6 through 8, the righteousness of God with believers. And here's how that section breaks down. Christ has certainly opened the door to salvation, but there has to be an identification with him in our lives, and Romans chapter 6 begins to explain how that works. The first step in that identification is baptism. And between Romans 6 verse 1 and 7 verse 6, the apostle gives three examples of the significance of baptism. It's a new life, a new master, and a new husband. And in the context of the new husband that he describes as he enters Romans chapter 7, he says that we leave the old husband behind and we cleave to the new. That is, we leave the law of Moses behind and we cleave to the side of Jesus Christ. Because even though the law was appointed by God, even though it was wholly just and good, it had limitations. For example, the very entrance of the law into the world exposed sin. As soon as sin saw a prohibition, it was inflamed and wanted to do the thing that was now prohibited, which it had never considered before. So the law... Uh, outlined to man just how far he was from God, but in the very process of doing that, also inflamed a desire within man to disobey God. That begins then, for the balance of Romans 7, an explanation of the conflict in the mind of man, the conflict between flesh and spirit that we all fall prey to that runs all the way through into chapter 8. The warfare. And therefore, as we have it on the screen there, the relationship between the law and sin. Well, Romans chapter 8, what happens next? Well, the answer is Romans chapter 8 is the solution to the problem. And the structure is very simple. Verses 1 to 4. Christ did what the law could not do. He gave man a method of salvation which the law could never do. Verses 5 to 11. In so doing, he demonstrated the way of life that God expects from all his children. He expects, well, he saw that way of life in his son, and he expects it in all his other sons. Now, the law ought to have taught the Jews that. I mean, it was a schoolmaster to lead them to Christ. It ought to have taught them a certain form of conduct, but it never did because they never used it that way. Well... Law could never, it could lead you to Christ, but it could never save you because as Hebrews 9 says, it could not make the conscience perfect. You could, of course, keep the law of Moses without having any internal change. Well, you can't follow the Lord Jesus Christ without having any internal change. That's how Christ triumphs over the law, you see. And what happens next in Romans 8, verses 12 to 17 he describes what real sons look like. What real sons look like. And of course, they're copies of Jesus Christ. But there's a problem. And the problem is this. Sin fights back. Sin fights back. There are two enormous forces, both vying for control of this body. One is Jesus Christ and the other of sin. And the problem is that sin lives here. That's the problem. So sin fights back. And what the apostle does from verse 18 through to the end of the, well, sorry, verse 26 through to the end of the chapter is he gives three pieces of advice to us to alleviate the suffering that's caused by sin. Verses 26 and 27, divine assistance in prayer. Verses 28 to 30, providence in life. Verses 31 to 39, assurance of the kingdom. That is, the guarantee of salvation. Well, that brings us then to Romans chapter 8. And the first thing to observe is that Romans 8, just as you perhaps read these opening verses, Romans 8 is an absolute continuation from Romans chapter 7. And I've tried to illustrate it like this on the screen. Here's a copy of your Bible, and I've just colored in 
Two words or two groups of words, one red, one blue. The reds are all the flesh and the blue are all the spirit. This is the duality of conflict in your mind. And the warfare that the apostle spoke about, this this autobiography that he gives towards the end of Romans chapter 7, rolls straight into Romans chapter 8, you see? Verse 1, end of verse 1, flesh versus spirit. Verse 2, the law of the spirit versus the law of sin. Verse 4, Flesh versus spirit, verse 5. Flesh, flesh, spirit, spirit. You you can see the conflict that's happening. Now, now that conflict in Romans 8 is simply a continuation of the conflict that began in Romans chapter 7 between the law of Paul's mind and the law of sin and death in his body, you see? My point is that the chapter break doesn't help us. I mean, it might be a useful enough section break, but it's really not a chapter break. It ought not to be there. And what you're seeing, you see, as you open Romans 8, is two completely different modes of thinking which are locked in mortal combat. So serious was it that at the end of chapter 7, in verse 25, the apostle makes this overwhelming confession. He says in the last half of verse 25, So then with the mind I serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin." That's what, I've got, that's what I've got to contend with for all my born days, he says. That's the conflict I'm up for. And so severe was that conflict in his life that it drove him to despair. Now, because no matter how hard he tried, you see, he was not able to get his flesh to follow the lead of his mind. He knew what he should do, but he just didn't do it. And every day, sin would win battles against him which led him to the point of exasperation in verse 24 of Romans chapter 7. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? So that's how chapter 7 concludes. I've got a warfare. I'm losing the warfare. I can't do it by myself. Who's going to deliver me? The answer is Jesus Christ. And chapter 8 commences the solution to the problem. Therefore, Chapter 8, verse 1, you see, there is therefore immediately linking us to chapter 7. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. No condemnation. Now, what does that mean? It would appear to say that if we're in Christ and walk after the flesh, but not after the spirit, our sins are not condemned by God. Well, let's be careful. It's not saying that God doesn't condemn sin. Psalm 7 verse 11 says that he's angry with the wicked every day. What it means in verse 1 is that there is no ultimate condemnation for sin in our lives, for those in Christ. Why? Well, because we have forgiveness. So there's no ultimate condemnation. We don't fall prey to the just judgment that comes upon sin if we're in Christ, because we're forgiven. And then the last half of the verse goes on and says, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And you've got to be aware that those words are not actually there in the best manuscripts. Now, those words are not wrong. So that phrase, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit, they're not wrong because the exact words appear at the end of verse 4 those very same words, but the the translators have added them to verse 1 to perhaps add context to verse 1. Otherwise, verse 1 might appear to read there's no condemnation for sin at all. The problem is that adding those words to verse 1 changes the emphasis of verse 1. You think about it. If we read verse 1 without those last couple of lines... We read, there's therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. What's the emphasis? The emphasis is being in Christ Jesus, being in the truth, identification with Christ. As soon as you put those additional words in, it completely changes the emphasis from identification with Christ to obedience, doesn't it? Because the emphasis all of a sudden becomes Walking not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And as I say, that's not wrong. I mean, that that concept is not wrong. 
But it does change the basic emphasis of verse 1. And the point of verse 1 is a point about identification, not about our walk. That all comes later on. Christ is the one that solves the wretchedness, you see, of chapter 7 and verse 24. That's the point. Well, of course, verse 1 also then creates an obvious question, doesn't it? How is it possible that there's no condemnation in Christ? Now, I told you it's by forgiveness. Well, verse 1 doesn't say that. It just says there's no condemnation for you if you're in Christ Jesus. How? Verse 2. Because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. That's how there's no condemnation in verse 1. Now, what does that mean? Well, we're made free in Christ. That's why. That's how. Verse 2. We're free. Free from what? Free from, it says, free from the law of sin and death in verse 2. Well, how? Why, well, by forgiveness. We're made free because we won't be subject to the condemnation of verse 1. Well, well, that's a little bit complicated. What is the law of sin and death? And for that matter, at the, at the outset of verse 2, what is the law of the spirit of life? Well, here's the simple answer. You can understand verse 2 very easily by comparison with chapter 7 and verse 25. There are two laws in verse 2. The law of the spirit of life and the law of sin and death. Two laws. And there are two laws in chapter 7 and verse 25. The law of God and the law of sin. So let's pick those apart. The law of the spirit of life in verse 2. What is it? Well, it's called the law of God in chapter 7 and verse 25. What is that? It's the gospel. It's the truth. Now, here's a quote you'll know, but listen carefully to the words. John 6, verse 63. The words that I speak to you, Jesus says, they are spirit and they are life. John 6, 63. So you see, the law of the spirit of life is the words that Jesus spoke. It's the gospel. It's the truth. That's what he's saying here. And you know from John 8 verse 32 that the truth shall make you free. Free from what? Free from death. Because the truth offers forgiveness, you see. So there's the freedom which is offered by the law of the spirit of life. So verse 2. The truth in Christ Jesus has made me free, free from the condemnation of verse 1, of the law of sin and death. So now what's the law of sin and death? Well, back to chapter 7 and verse 25, the law of sin. The law of sin and death is the law of sin. And if you go up a couple of verses to verse 23 of chapter 7, you'll find that that law of sin resides in our members. So it's not the law of Moses, this law of sin and death. It's the law of sin in our members. What's that? It's the ruling impulses of our human nature. Present in every one of us. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. So there are the two laws of verse 2. So if I was to rephrase verse 2, a bit of an oversimplification, but for your benefit I could say it like this. That the truth in Christ Jesus has the power to forgive us for the sins caused by our members. That's what verse 2 is really saying. Verse 3. For what the law, now, this is now the law of Moses in verse 3, what the law of Moses could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Now, you might immediately make the link between the condemned of verse 3 and the condemnation in verse 1. We are under no condemnation in verse 1 or no ultimate condemnation for our sins because of Christ's sacrifice in verse 3. But verse 3 is a tricky verse and it's going to need a bit of, need a bit of explanation. So what I've done is I've pulled verse 3 apart phrase by phrase 
to put it on the screen. Now, when I talked about this in my family only 24 hours ago, I said, is, is this very difficult? I mean, it seems really simple, but as soon as I started to ask myself what each phrase of this verse meant, I found it hard to prove. And then, of course, digression, you may be aware that this verse is used by advocates of clean flesh to prove that Christ is in our likeness, but not quite like us. Or by advocates of androism to say that he destroyed a commodity called sin in the flesh. All right. So the point is, it's a rested verse, even in the brotherhood. What does verse 3 mean? Look at the screen. It's really very simple. What the law could not do. Now, just, just pause there for a moment. There's actually a lot of things that the law of Moses couldn't do. For example, it could not give eternal life because it was never meant to. It was meant to expose sin. It didn't have any means to forgive sin. And it certainly couldn't give eternal life. At best, it could give you long life in the land. But that's not what it's saying here. There was something else the law couldn't do because the issue of what the law couldn't do in verse 3 is whatever it came to do, it couldn't do because of the weakness of man. Well, the law couldn't give eternal life. Well, that's not the weakness of man. That's the weakness of the law. So what's verse 3 saying? What the law could not do. It's true that the law never promised eternal life. Yes, yes, yes. But... The point here is, because of man's conduct, it couldn't even do what it was intended to do. The law was meant to be a schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. But because of what man did with the law, it didn't even achieve that. When Christ came to the Jewish world in the first century, they didn't recognize him, though they had the oracles of God in their hand for 1,500 years. So the law didn't even do what it was meant to do because of the weakness of of flesh. What was this weakness of flesh? What did the Jews do with the law? Well, number one, they didn't keep it. They didn't keep it. Number two, they instead changed it. They used it to to, uh, decorate themselves in self-righteousness. They used it to make themselves better than other men. Number three, not only that, but the law itself provoked sin inflamed sin and made the Jewish conduct even worse. So, therefore, the law which came to teach men about the need for Jesus Christ and show them the gulf between themselves and God failed on every count because of the weakness of the flesh. Therefore, God acted. He sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Well, Galatians 4.4 4 says he was born of a woman. So he was the son of God and the son of man. And he had our nature. And Hebrews 2.14, that I'm quoting there, you know, it makes four points about the, about the identification of Christ with our nature. He also himself likewise took part of the same flesh and blood as the children, doesn't it? So, I mean, it's emphasized four times that Christ had our precise nature. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh. Sinful flesh, that doesn't mean flesh itself is a sin, but your flesh leads to sin. It's only called sinful because it's full of all the impulses of sin. You read this sort of language in verse 5 of chapter 7, the motions of sins which are are in our members, or the passions of sins. It's these three lusts of 1 John 2. God sent his own son in the likeness of simple flesh and for sin, or as the margin says, by a sacrifice for sin. Jesus Christ was a sin offering. He condemned sin. Now there's a good one. How did he condemn sin? Well, he condemned sin by his obedience. Does that make sense to you? Look at Hebrews 11 verse 7. Noah condemned the world by building an ark. Noah condemned sin by his obedience. Christ condemned sin by obeying what God said, you see, in the flesh. He condemned sin in the flesh. That is to say, where sin resides. He resisted sin in its, or on its own territory, in his body, because he had a body just like yours and mine. Well, that's Romans 8 verse 3. 
what the law could not the law of Moses could not do in that it was weak through the conduct of the Jewish people God sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh sin prone like the rest of us to become a sacrifice for sin and by his obedience condemn sin where sin resides that is in his own body he fought the very same warfare as Paul, as Paul fights in chapter 7 and he won it you see so it's not, not so hard actually verse 3 well now that you see it verse 4 that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit and the law of verse 4 once again is the law of Moses but here's the thing what is the righteousness of the law of Moses and the answer is it's the righteous requirements of the law of Moses the RSV says that the just requirements of the law might be fulfilled well there's the question what are the just requirements of the law of Moses? What are the righteous requirements of the law? It's simple in one verse. Romans 13 and verse 10. Love is the fulfillment of the law. The righteous requirement of the law of Moses was to love God and to love your neighbor. Romans 13 verse 10. And this is the explanation, you see of why Paul had such an agony of mind in the previous chapter. You think about it. In the normal course of life, in your life, in my life, if a person really loves something with their mind, we might naturally expect their body to follow or, or to respond accordingly. So perhaps you love chocolate. Or well, your body will run down to the shops and buy chocolate. Maybe you buy two blocks of chocolate. Perhaps you love music. Your head will naturally incline towards that music because you, because you love it. And that principle, of course, is true of everything. So long as what you love is compatible with your body. And this is the problem, you see, in Romans chapter 7, because Paul loved something that was foreign to his nature. You and I love something which is foreign to our nature. And even though the apostle's mind had fallen in love with the truth, his body would not, under any circumstances, come under its jurisdiction. It was a wretched condition that he found himself in, as he explains it. And the problem is that that's exactly the problem that confronts us. The more we know, the more we love the things of the truth, the keener and the sharper the conflict becomes between our mind and our body. And the more the mind cleaves to the things of God, the more the body tries to undermine that and tries to subvert that and everything it stands for. That's why. That's why the wisdom of the world, the entertainment of the world, the materialism of the world, the business of the world, that's why it's so attractive to us. It's native to us, isn't it? It's as simple as that. It's native to us. Of course, you didn't have to try to fall in love with the things of the world. Because we're made of that stuff. We've got a natural inclination toward those things. Here's the problem. Verse 5. They that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. They that are after the spirit do mind the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. Margin. For to mind the flesh is death. And to be spiritually minded, margin, mind the spirit, is life and peace. Because... The carnal mind is enmity against God. It's not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. You see, Paul's problem and our problem, he loves something which is not native to his flesh, and his body will not be brought under the control of the truth under any circumstance, because it rails against it with every fibre of its beings. But what does that mean to you and me when we read those four verses, five to eight? Well, it means this. If we were to use worldly arguments to justify things, worldly standards to measure ourselves by, if we're given to worldly pursuits in our spare time, we've got to understand that verse eight says it's displeasing to God. So think about, think about all the decisions we make in our lives. I mean, I mean the consequential decisions we make in our lives. Think about what we do with our spare time. Think about what our personal goals 
might be. And ask yourself how they line up, how those things line up between Romans 8 verse 8. Because when Christ comes and asks us what we've, what we've done for him, what we've done for his truth, what we've done for his ecclesia, that's exactly the conversation we're going to have. Did we please God or didn't we? Were the decisions we made pleasing to God or weren't they? It's all based upon whether we're minding the flesh or minding the spirit. What is our inclination in the making of our decisions? Now, I don't want to labour the point. It's, a, it's, a, it's not a complicated point, and you can see the point. But it's got to be said. Unless everything we do and every major decision we make can be reconciled back to this book, we're at desperate risk of falling prey to the carnal mind and never underestimate the carnal mind. Now, understanding that and the nature of the conflict that's rolled out of chapter, eight in, uh, out of chapter 7 into chapter 8 helps you enormously when you come to verse 9. Romans 8 and verse 9. Because look what he says. Ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. As you can see, just by reading this verse, this is a verse which has caused a lot of confusion, not especially in the brotherhood, but amongst the churches. Because we've got a lot of spirits in this verse. We've got the spirit, then we've got the spirit of God, and then we've got the spirit of Christ. This, of course, is the basis of the Pentecostal suggestion that the Holy Spirit, power, somehow takes over the mind of a believer and helps them live the truth. And so, of course, the, the translators here have put a capital S on spirit to signify that. Three capital S's in this verse, none of which are justified or can be justified. But just look at the first line or two of verse 9. What's it really saying? Ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. Now, that is, you know the context of that debate because that's exactly what you've just read in the opening verses of verse 8 and in the closing verses of, sorry, in the opening verses of chapter 8 and the closing verses of chapter 7. He's merely continuing his description of the warfare between these two commodities of flesh and spirit. We're talking about a fleshly mind and a spiritual mind when we come to chapter 8, verse 9. So the spirit, therefore, in the second line of verse 9, is simply spirituality or a godly disposition. All right, but then the question is, if we're not in the flesh but in the spirit, we are so, if so be the spirit of God dwells in us, and if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he's not Christ's. Well, what is the spirit of God and what is the spirit of Christ? And are they different to the spirit, that is the spiritual mind of the, of the second line, or are they the same? Well, let's talk about the spirit of God. What, what do we know from this chapter about the spirit of God? Well, what you find in verse 14 is this. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So the Spirit of God, whatever it is, the Spirit of God creates sons. Well, James 1 and verse 18 tells us that of his own will begat he us by the word of truth. And so it appears as though the Spirit of God here is in fact the word. Because the word is that substance that creates sons. Well, then what about the Spirit of Christ? Well, you've got a parallel idea. Verse 9 is very parallel to verse 10, and this answers the question. You've got the Spirit of Christ spoken of in verse 9, and then verse 10 goes on and says, And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, and the Spirit is life because of righteousness, he says. All right, well, what does it mean if Christ be in you? Well, Galatians 2 and verse 20 says, I'm crucified with Christ, Paul says. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. So the spirit of Christ is just spirituality. 
isn't it? It's just the same as the, as the spirit in the second line of verse 9. So, so read verse 9 again, making our substitutions. Ye are not fleshly, but spiritual. If so be that the word of God dwells in you. Now if any man have not spirituality or a spiritual disposition, he is none of his. You see, that's what verse 9 is saying. And all the way through this chapter, as you've seen before, and as, you, as you'll perhaps appreciate after these verses, the, the, the spirit here is either a reference to the word which creates sons or to spirituality, a spiritual mind. There are two exceptions. One is in verse 16, and the other is in verse 23, which are both references to the Holy Spirit gifts. In the first century, of course, verse 16 tells us that the Holy Spirit was a witness to the credentials of the believers. Acts 15 verse 8 says that when the Gentiles came to the truth, God which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness by giving them the Holy Spirit. Verse 23, speaking of the first fruits of the Spirit, is also a reference to the Holy Spirit gifts, because Ephesians 1 verse 14 says that the Holy Spirit powers an earnest or a down payment of our inheritance, a taste of of the power of the age to come. But neither in verse 16 or in verse 23 do we have any hint that the Holy Spirit, even though it's talking about the gifts, that that Holy Spirit is necessary to operate upon the mind of a believer to create spirituality. The word alone is sufficient to do that. Well, verse 17 then. And if we're children... If we're children, then we're heirs. Heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, we shall also be glorified together. And here's, as you start, just cast your mind down, your, your eye down those verses. Here's the ultimate application. If we are spiritual, if we cleave in our minds to the thinking of the spirit and eschew the things of the thinking of the flesh, we become children of God. And if we are children, then we're heirs, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Now, what does that mean? It means he will share his kingdom with us. We become co-rulers with Christ in the kingdom age. That's what verse 17 is saying. But can you see in the middle of verse 17 the presence of sin? I mean, this is the hope we have in the fact that God has a son who in his own way was perfect, and if we, if we emulate that, we become sons ourselves, but it's not without a fight. If so be that we suffer with him, we might also be glorified together, he says. And there's sin, you see, poking its head up in the middle of verse 17, because it won't come without pain. Because everything we're talking about, aspiring to here, is, is hostile to the bodies that we, we own. It's not native to us to be sons of God. And therefore, sin's going to fight every step of the way. Tooth and nail, you see. As a consequence then, verses 18 to 25, Paul talks about the effect of sin, which, of course, is suffering. Sin's going to try and stop you becoming a child of God, and that's going to cause a degree of suffering not only in your own body, but in the world in which you live, which has all but given itself over to sin. And the apostle gives the antidote to that. He says, all right, suffering's going to happen. Sin's not going to like it. I mean, it's, it's almost like you're performing surgery upon yourself, trying to take something out of, your, out of your body which has got tentacles running all through it, and you're just dragging it out bit by bit. There's nothing painless about that. He says, how do you get through it? And the answer is, by a vision of the future. A vision of the future. And look at it, verse 18. For I reckon, he says, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. The sufferings of today don't remotely compare with the glory of the future. Now, you know, that's exactly the antidote the Lord Jesus Christ used. Hebrews 12, verse 2. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross and despised the shame. So he also, 
looked at the future to mitigate the sufferings of the present, didn't he? In fact, verse 19 goes on and says, and we're not alone, by the way. We're not alone in the suffering we endure now. All creation suffers. The earnest expectation of, as it ought to be, as the earnest expectation of creation waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. So all creation is an earnest expectation. That, that, those two words are one word in the Greek, which means to watch with anxious and persistent expectation. And what's creation watching for? The unveiling of the sons of God. Here's J.B. Phillips. So here's a, a free translation, which, if, if you like, paints the picture of verse 19, if not completely accurately. The whole creation is on tiptoes to see the wonderful sight of the sons of God coming into their own. Now, why? Why is creation... We're talking here about the natural creation. Why is creation waiting for the revelation of the sons of God in verse 19? What for? Well, you think about it. When Adam sinned, verses 20 and 21 go on to tell you, when Adam sinned, he was cursed. But not just himself. The curse was universal. Humanity was cursed with sin and death. The ground was cursed with thorns and thistles. The animal creation was cursed, so carnivores were born. And you see, now creation's waiting in hope. So creation was a witness to the events that took place in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3. They were unwillingly, unwilling witnesses. Look, look at verse 20. The creation was made subject to vanity, not willing, but by reason of him who has subjected it, in hope. So creation is standing on tiptoes, waiting for the revelation of the sons of God, because creation's hope, I mean, he's personifying creation here, but the hope of creation will be outworked when the curse is removed as well. Creation's waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. Because on the day that Adam sinned, he was given a hope, wasn't he? It was the hope of Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, that one day a second Adam would come, who would reverse the curse. So the curse that creation is now subject to, it heard the words in the garden in Genesis chapter 3 of the day that the second Adam would come and reverse everything. And we know creation heard it, because Genesis 3 verse 15 was spoken to the serpent, wasn't it? Those words were spoken to creation in the presence of the first human pair. That's the hope that creation, speak, that creation has in verse 20, the hope of the coming of the Messiah. Not, not, if you like, not the manifestation of the sons of God so much, but the manifestation of the Son of God. That's the hope that creation is looking for. But in the meantime, all creation suffering, verse 22. And we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And in the figure, as we say, creation's on tiptoes, waiting for the kingdom to come, because the day we get immortality, the curse is lifted from her as well. And that causes enormous agony for creation. And so she travails in pain, verse 22 says, waiting for the birth of the kingdom age. And the stronger that pain gets, the more she wants the kingdom to come, just the same as us. And we see the trouble about us in the world, trouble in the ecclesia, and all we want is for the kingdom to come. And there's purpose in that too. I mean, what would happen if everything settled down? What would happen if North Korea got back in its box? I don't know. Donald Trump lost the next election and somebody more moderate came in. Putin pulled out of Syria and everything sort of went down. Ecclesial troubles all sort of dissipated. What would we do? Oh, we'd probably build that extra room on the house, wouldn't we? Maybe take that promotion at work. Very probably take our eye off the joy set before us. So there is purpose in suffering. There is purpose in the birth pains of creation. But then how much comfort do we take in our vision? So there's the vision. There's the vision that, that, that the Bible paints before us. How much of a comfort is that to you? Think about the troubles that we're going through. Some of us are going through considerable troubles right at this very moment. How much would that vision 
help you. Well, Isaiah 65 and verse 17 says, Behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come to mind. What he's telling us is that the kingdom age will be so supremely greater than the events of today that we won't even remember the troubles of today. And, and, like it's unilateral in Isaiah 65. No matter what the troubles of today are, you won't remember them on the other side of immortality. We'll put it, we'll put it like this. Let's uh, put it in a, in a figure a little closer to home. John 16, verse 21. We're talking about creation travailing in pain. A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she has delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. And all the heartache and the tribulation of the previous nine months evaporates in a wink because she's holding this child. He says, that's what the kingdom will be like. That's what the kingdom's going to be like. Because we're going to be born again aren't we? This is what birth does to the previous nine months of tribulation. And we're talking about a mortal child. What do you think it's going to be like when you're born again in immortality? And and look at the language. Verse 18, the glory that shall be revealed in us. Verse 19, the earnest expectation. Verse 21, the glorious liberty of the children of God, or as Rotherham says, The freedom of the glory of the children of God. Verse 23, the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. I mean, right now, verse 15 says we've got the spirit of adoption. In verse 23, we will become the adoption. But did you notice that? Look look closely at verse 23. Not only they... That is creation. But ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. So we wait for the adoption, the redemption of our, plural, body. Singular. Why doesn't he say the redemption of our bodies? What's the body of verse 23? It's the body of Christ, isn't it? It's the corporate body of Christ. It's the ecclesia in immortality. It's the singular immortal bride of Christ. That's what gets redeemed in verse 23. And while we wait for the kingdom to come, he says, I'll give you three things to help you. Verse 26, 27, prayer. Critical, but not always easy. He says, I'll help you there. Verses 28 to 30, an assurance of providence. The confidence that God knows what he's doing. And verses 31 to 39, an assurance that will be in the kingdom of God. Three commodities to help you through the present distress, he says. You see, it's in moments of extreme suffering that we find prayer difficult. I mean, in extreme blessing, we find prayer difficult because we're preoccupied. In extreme suffering, we might also find prayer very difficult, grappling with why this trial might have come upon us, not knowing whether to pray on one hand for deliverance or on the other hand for endurance, not knowing where everything will end up. Likewise, he says in verse 26, the Spirit, he says, also helpeth our infirmities. Now, what's the spirit there? What's that spirit? Well, the whole context up until now has been that the spirit was our spiritual mind or our disposition or spirituality. That's that's the context of verse 9. That's the context of verse 16. There is a suggestion in these verses that the spirit is Christ, but you read the verses, and I don't believe that makes sense at all. Look. The Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. 
Now, the suggestion that the Spirit here is Christ is based upon the fact that verse 27 says the Spirit makes intercession, and it says at the end of verse 34 that Christ makes intercession. Well, what are my answers to that problem? Threefold. Firstly, the entire context up until now in Romans 8 of the Spirit is that the Spirit is used preeminently of our disposition. A disposition created by the Spirit word, but our disposition. Secondly, there's no doubt that Christ is an intercessor in verse 34, but no need that he's the only intercessor. There can be more than one intercessor in our lives. So just because it is Christ in verse 34 doesn't mean it must be Christ in verse 27. Number three, when it says he, in verse 27, it says he maketh intercession, but the word he ought to be it. It's in the neuter gender. Your diaglot will show you that. It's in the neuter. It's not a person making intercession, as it were, in verse 27. It's not Christ. It's an it. And finally, actually I said three points, I've got four. This intercession uh, is by groaning. Groaning. Now, why would that be? Why would the Lord Jesus Christ groan? Why couldn't he articulate just what he wants to say? No, no, I don't think it makes sense at all, brothers and sisters, for this to be the Lord Jesus Christ. What are those verses saying? Well, I think they're saying this. There are times when we don't know what to pray for. We might be in distress. We might not know why things are happening to us. So we go to God in prayer. We look for answers, but there don't seem to be any answers. We want the situation to end, but we don't know whether the situation's for our ultimate benefit. We don't know what, we don't know which way to turn. And we're vexed. And we can't put together, we can't articulate the kind of prayer we ought to say. And in that situation, the apostle says, your disposition speaks louder than your words. You want to see that? John 12, verse 27, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Now my soul is troubled, he says. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause I came into this hour. Should I pray to be released from the cross? Or should I, I pray to endure the cross? But I don't want to go to the cross. Well, what should I pray for? Can, can you see the tension in the Lord's mind? Between huh, what his mind knew what, he, what was, was best and what his body wanted to do. And what he doesn't know is whether God has any other way around the prospect of crucifixion. So he doesn't know what to say 24 hours before it happened. He said to them, Mark 14, verse 34, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry you here, he says to the apostles, and watch. And he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. You see, he knows what he wants, but he doesn't know whether it's the right thing to ask for. And he cries, Abba, Father. The very words, I might say, of Romans 8 and verse 15. There's nothing magical about that, by the way. God knows what we need before we ask. Jesus said that in Matthew 6 and verse 8. Before you call, I will answer, God said to the Jews in Isaiah 65 verse 24. Don't you think God can read the minds of his children? And when you can't put the words together, your disposition answers for your lack of articulation. That's what he's saying. An enormous help in trial, you see. And the second resource, verses 28 to 30. The understanding of God's dealings with man. Look at verse 28. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. It may sometimes be hard to believe, <laughs> that all things are working together for good. I mean, think about Joseph. The story of Joseph. He could never explain why things that happened to him actually happened to him. So he's thrown in a pit while his brothers eat lunch and listen to him scream. He's sold into slavery. He doesn't see his family for years and years. He's framed by a woman. He finds himself in jail. He doesn't know what he's doing there. Month after month for a couple of years in the, in the cell of a prison. But back in his mind, he knows 
This is a pro- there's a prophecy of sheaves bowing down to him. See, he always knew there was a divine plan, but how he was going to get from A to B, he could never have forecast. And did he want to go that route to become the saviour of his brethren? Absolutely not. And of course, it's the same with us. We, did, we just don't know why God takes us through this river or over that mountain, but there is a plan, you see. And this verse proves that in between verses 28 to 30, he gives five reasons why we should expect to be in the kingdom of God. The first one in verse 29, because God did foreknow us. That is, he foreknew us before we came to the truth. He, he knew before we were born that he was going to call us to the truth. For whom he did foreknow, he did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the that we might that he might be the firstborn among many brethren so we've been predestinated to stand alongside Christ he won't be alone in immortality now what does that mean this predestinate now i realize we've just done ephesians and well, perhaps a couple of months ago now ephesians chapter 1 where brother grant explained this but it's very simple and and when you come to this verse in romans 8 verse 29 well, what, what's the temptation? The temptation is to, word, is to read the word predestinate and to think in our mind that that, that, that that means destiny and that God therefore has, has a certain destiny mapped out for us and therefore we're not our own, we're not in control of our lives, we're going to be in the kingdom or we're going to be not and it's not, it's not up to us, it's destiny. Well, well, the problem is that that's not really reading what it says. You've got to read the whole phrase. God didn't predestinate us. He predestinated us to be conformed to the image of his son. And instead of reading the word predestinate, you could read the word plan, because it really just means plan. God's put a plan in our lives. He's mapped out our lives. It's our choice whether we stay on the map. But God has mapped out a pathway by which he'll get us into the kingdom of God. It's completely up to us whether we choose to use that pathway or whether we even want to be in the kingdom of God but he's made a plan that's all he's done, he's made a plan now those first two stages foreknowledge and predestination those both occur before we respond and then we hear the truth and verse 30 says we're called so we come in contact with the truth by that calling and then we're justified that's our baptism That's forgiveness of sins. Justified means made righteous or forgiven. So that's our baptism, and then we're glorified. There's the judgment seat. You see? A five-step process. And with that in mind, the the, the apostle now asks a question of his own. What, What else is there to know, he says? What else could God have done? Verse 31. What should we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with how shall how shall he not with him also freely give us all things, he says. He says in verse thirty one, what shall we say to these things? Which things? Well the five things of verses twenty eight to thirty. And perhaps you could extend it to all the other things that you've read in this chapter. God's assistance in prayer. The fact that we're, that we're, uh, our, our spirit answers for us in our lack of articulation. The fact that God has provided Christ as the means by which we are saved. But at least it means, in the very first instance, the five things of verses 28 to 30. What else could you think of in addition to those things? What else could you say? What else could be done? Well, he tells you now, from verses 31 to 39, the last picture. And it's of a courtroom. The courtroom of creation. Verse 33. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? And you've got to remove the italics. God that justifieth? Question mark. So here's the, here's the courtroom of creation. And God's the judge. The Lord Jesus Christ is the advocate seated at the right hand of God. That is your defense attorney. You're in the witness box answering for your life and the prosecution, well, that's sin because it's going to try and take you in the very opposite direction. 
Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? God that justified, that is the God that forgives God himself? Well, he's already justified us. We've been acquitted. Is he likely to judge us again? No, that's the point. Who is he that condemneth? Christ that died? Question mark. This is your defense lawyer. Is he going to condemn you? No, no, he's on your side. He's in court betting for you. Yea, Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God and who makes intercession for us. So he's speaking to the judge on our behalf in the courtroom of creation. This is the defense attorney, the advocate. Will he condemn us? How can he? He's acting in our defense. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword, This is the prosecution. How good is their case? So this is what's going to come upon you. So you're in the court of creation. This is like the courtroom of life. And the judge is ready to forgive. Your defense lawyer is the greatest defense lawyer there's ever been. But these are the bumps in the road. And there's seven of them here in verse 35. Oftentimes created by sin. And here's sin thrashing around for dear life at the feet of this advocate, but it's not dead yet. And what does sin say? Give up. Give up. Go back to how you were. It's not worth it. If my ecclesia did that to me, I'd leave the truth. You get better treatment in the world than this. I wouldn't take that from them. I'd resign. I'd take him to court. Sin has got all these great ideas, native ideas, native ideas. Look what the truth's doing to you. Tribulation, distress, persecution. If you're like them, none of these things would be happening to you. And you can see, you can see what sin does because it's got its own plan, doesn't it? It's its own king. And the apostle says, huh, I'm persuaded in verse 38 that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers, things present, things to come, height or depth or anything else in creation shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There were seven stumbling blocks in verse 35. There's ten things mentioned in verses 38 and 39. And look at them. The greatest forces in the world Death and life, angels and governments, present and future, height and depth, all creation, he says. But you know the one thing that's missing in these verses? The one thing that is extremely conspicuous by its absence, and it's the greatest force of all. The judge is on one side, the defence is on the other side. The prosecution's no match for them. What about the defendant? What do you read about the defendant? What about us? If we give up, the prosecution's smiling all the way to the grave, isn't he? You've got to want it. What's the apostle's point? Nothing can stop you getting to the kingdom of God except yourself. Every other force in the world has already been overcome. You're there unless you don't want to be. What have we seen? So here's the summary of the section, chapters 6 through 8. Having seen the true place of faith and law in the redemption of mankind, a number of questions arise. Shall we continue in sin so as to increase grace? No, says the apostle, In Christ we die to sin and begin a new life. There's the story of Romans 6. Should we sin because we're no longer under law then? No, he says. We now serve righteousness, not sin. We're espoused to a new husband. Romans 7. Well, is the law the cause of sin? Because it identifies and inflames sin. He says, no, by no means. The law is holy. Sin resists the law, which only proves that the law was not sinful. Well, then has the law killed man? No, no. The law of Moses didn't kill man. There's another law inside of man, and that law kills man. 
The law of Moses simply showed man the impossibility of a sinless life. But, Romans 8, Christ has conquered where man could not. If we walk with the disposition of Christ, we become sons and will be saved as that son was. But sin will try and prevent this. And so suffering is inevitable. But take courage. The suffering of the present doesn't compare with the glory of the future. And what's more, God is on our side. Christ is our saviour and nothing in the world can separate us from God's desire to save us except us.